Welcome everyone to our fourth session. Our opening prayer will be on page 240. We we'll use the prayer of Blessed William Joseph Shamanad on page 240. Let's pray this prayer together. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. O oh, chaste spouse of the most pure and most holy of creatures, how happy you must be for having found such favor and grace before the Eternal Father, who gave His Son, before the Son, who made you the tutor of His sacred humanity, before the Holy Spirit, who entrusted His spouse to you, so that you could be like the cherubim, who guarded the fruit of life in the Garden of Eden. How happy and blessed are they whom you love and whom you take under your protection. O faithful guardian of the Mother of God, keep those who honor you amid the trials and joys of this life. Lovable tutor of Jesus, help your servants in the dangers and difficulties of their exile. May they feel the effects of your love. Obtain for them devotion to your spouse, fidelity to your son, unfailing respect for the Eternal Father, who reigns with the Holy Spirit through endless ages. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. We're now on day 22 of our 33-day consecration, looking at our fourth week and looking ahead to the fifth week. Again, last time we stressed the three different theories about St. Joseph's reaction when he found Mary was uh, with child by the Holy Spirit. We mentioned the suspicion theory, the stupefaction theory, and the reverence theory, those three different ones. We won't review those again, but those are some key um, reflections about Joseph's reaction to discovering that. This week, um, we hear a lot about uh, sleep and dreams. We'll have that about the sleeping Joseph. We mentioned before that devotion to the sleeping Joseph with the statue, a prayer is placed under the statue of St. Joseph. Well, those uh, sleep and dreams, it's good to reflect on those in Scripture and what they mean. We see several times uh, the holy people in Scripture have a dream that uh, prefigures something to them. So think of Jacob the patriarch. He is fleeing from Esau, his brother. He lays down to sleep. He sees the ladder, Jacob's ladder, angels ascending and descending. And Jesus will reference that as well to him being the new place of God's presence, of course, as, as God himself, as the Son. But Jacob built an altar there, where he had this dream, this holy dream. And of course, Joseph the patriarch, we didn't stress before, but interpretation of dreams was his special skill. So when he was in prison, the Pharaoh had that dream about, uh, I think, the uh, fat cows and the thin cows, talked about the years of plenty and the years of famine. And because of that vision he had interpreting Pharaoh's dream, he was able to store up grain to preserve the country in time of famine. Uh, and also Daniel the prophet, he had a power to interpret dreams. Now he had visions himself, and were they dreams? It seems like he was awake when he had those, but especially the king had those dreams uh, in Babylon, and he asked the people, interpret my dream. They said, well, tell us the dream first. He said, oh no, I know how you magicians work. You're going to make up some weird thing. I'm not even going to tell you my dream. They say, well, that's impossible. No one can know your dream. So, of course, Daniel comes forward, and he interprets that dream with the statue with the four parts. Uh, it was smashed by the mountain, of course, prefigures the church in later times. So the power of dreams and then interpreting dreams and things done in sleep. We see that uh, sleep is a special time of receptivity to listen to God. And so those in Scripture, when they're sleeping, God is still working in the background. We might call it like sleep mode in our computers now. Stuff is still going on in the background. Well, the same thing is true for us. God can still work through those dreams uh, through us as well. And also, it shows a trust in God. We talked about the sleeping Joseph. In sleep, he received dreams as well. St. Joseph, husband of Mary. He received in his sleep those dreams telling him to trust in God's plan. And it was many dreams he received to first trust, leave to Egypt, and then come back to Nazareth later on. Um, I think of the psalm especially, it says, Vain is your earlier rising, you're going later to rest, when the Lord pours gifts in his beloved while they slumber. It says, that, don't worry so much about working and getting ahead. It said, if you trust in God, you're faithful, you try your best, the Lord will pour gifts upon you. So not to cut out sleep and think, I'll get more stuff done. It said, oh no, rely upon God. Because even in sleep, he can be blessing you. Things can be happening to you at that time as well. 
So that theme of sleep in sacred scripture and dreams comes through especially in St. Joseph. They had a good reflection about the visitation. So when Mary goes to see Elizabeth, her cousin, uh, it mentions maybe Joseph was along as well. So page 172 uh, talked about that a little bit. It was a dangerous thing to travel back in those days. And so uh, would Mary have gone alone? Very unlikely. She would go through the hill country to see her cousin Elizabeth. And might not Joseph have gone with her? And we don't know for sure that was the case. But it's possible that St. Joseph at least went with her there, went back to Nazareth to work, and then came and got her again three months later. Or perhaps he stayed all three months and he was there with her. It would uh, make more sense again why he would revere uh, Mary, that reverence theory uh, for the child in her womb, knowing she was pregnant with uh, the divine child, with Jesus Christ himself, uh, if he was there to hear what Elizabeth said. Blessed are you among women, blessed is the fruit of your womb. Those prayers of the Hail Mary. And also Mary's response, the Magnificat. As he heard that, he might have thought, wait a minute, something's going on here, something very special. So that could have helped to contribute to the reverence he had for the child and to know uh, when he received that dream, indeed, God himself had brought this child to be. Um, so it's not certain whether he went with Mary or not, but it's a good, uh, good guess that he might have done so. Uh, and protect her. It shows again that role of guarding her and uh, conveying her to her destination. So Joseph also helping travelers there. This kind of gets to the point too. He mentions on page 177 of that very interesting biological uh, tidbit, I guess we could say, discovered. They called it um, fetal uh, microchimerism. So the fact that some of the child's cells remain in the mother and some of the mother's cells remain in the child. So we talked about a connection we feel uh, with our children, of course. That's a real physical uh, backing for it. So many of the things we have spiritually, there's a physical component to those as well. So this idea of uh, that Mary, when uh, Joseph was with Mary later on, even then he was in the presence of Jesus to a degree because Mary received a share in Christ's divinity. Now this sounds weird for us a little bit, but it goes to the ancient Christian principle of divinization. So the ancient Christians, as they put it best, uh, God became man, so man could become God. They don't mean we actually become gods in some other strengths, but we become God-like is what they meant. This shows the whole idea of Christ sanctifying the world and transforming creation. And this gets to the Catholic understanding that our nature is deprived by original sin, not depraved. That would be the Luther, that was his sense of our nature, we are so corrupt God cannot make us holy. He just imputes holiness to us. Now we would say, wait a minute, God can't make us holy? Of course he can make us holy. God was there at the first creation. He can make a new creation and transform us. That's what we see in Revelation. All things are made new. Jesus says it, behold, I make all things new. So the same is true. This physical world becomes holy by God's presence here among us. This uh, interesting fact about the cells being in the mother and the child shows us that transformation that happens in the physical order. Well, the same is true. Whenever the holy people are around, they transform the world. Our notion of relics comes from this, this real fact that God uh, himself came into the world, Jesus Christ, right? And he transformed the world. And everything he went, the places he was, the things he did and said, he helped to make those places holy. So God's creation can be renewed from its deprived state by original sin. It can be restored to something even greater. That's what sanctification is. So even the physical things of this world can become holy. Now, of course, in the Holy Eucharist, we see that in the most extreme way, right? The bread and the wine become forever the body and blood of Christ. That's why we have to reserve in the tabernacle or consume the holy elements. Then they become one with our bodies. And so as St. Augustine said, we become what we receive. So we become Jesus by receiving Jesus. You are what you eat, as the saying goes. We become transformed into something holy. And ancient Christians call that divinization. So that principle is at work here as well. So the places that the Holy Family went with Jesus, he describes uh, Mary as that tabernacle who was carrying Jesus throughout the world, and St. Joseph adoring Jesus. Wherever he was, there was an adoration chapel, so to speak, where he was with Mary, with Jesus. Then Jesus, even when he's born, wherever he is with Jesus, he's in God's presence there. In Egypt, in Nazareth, Bethlehem, a very beautiful thought. That the world is in God is in something distant from his creation. He wants to be here in the midst of it. And so still today we have many relics, many holy things 
of the Holy Family and also of the saints as well. The most striking one was that holy wedding ring. Remember that? Page 136 talked about this uh, sacred wedding ring of Mary and Joseph. Very interesting. Now again, we think, really? Is it really the wedding ring of Joseph and Mary? Well, why not? It's probably it's something very special that Christians wouldn't preserve such a thing. We have many other examples of such relics. Um, we'll talk about those in a second. But this touches on the idea of this holy ring, how we know such a thing would be the wedding ring. Well, a vision of St. Anne Catherine Emmerich helped to uh, confirm this. Now, the striking thing about her is she was a cloistered nun, had many visions that proved to be true. The, most, the one I like a lot is the House of Mary in Ephesus. So after Mary, uh, she uh, was cared for by St. John, as Jesus said from the cross. St. John became Bishop of Ephesus. He was up there, or well, Patriarch uh, of Ephesus. And Mary Magdalene and Mary were with him. I know this because the ancient church at Ephesus was dedicated to St. John and St. Mary Magdalene. They never did such a thing, a double dedication, unless both saints were there. The same was true in Augsburg, by the way, in Germany. Saints Ulrich and Afra were the patrons of the city. They were Roman martyrs, and the church bears both their names. So St. John was there, and so Mary would have been with him, and uh, she was there uh, at the end of her life. But uh, St. Catherine said, yeah, but she retired south of Ephesus, to a place in the wilderness. She described the shape of the house. There's a hill right there. Mary would pray there. It says, says there is where she was assumed into heaven. So some German guys were in Ephesus in the 1800s. They said, let's find that house. Let's see if it's real. So they walk for three hours south of Ephesus. They say, let's give up. We're never going to find the house. Then a band of Christians come along and they say, well, where are you guys going? The Christians say, to the holy house of Mary. Say, All right, we'll follow you. So they followed. They found, sure enough, the ruins of a church built on the ruins of a house. Remember, the Ottoman Empire occupied the area and destroyed many Christian sites. So the ruins were still there. And so even the 19th century, Christians, the Eastern Christians, would go there to uh, celebrate the Feast of the Assumption. So sure enough, soon after that, the Vatican transferred the indulgence for the Assumption from Jerusalem, where they thought Mary was assumed, to that place in Ephesus. So again, this vision of Anne Catherine Emmerich proved to be true. She had never been there, never seen it herself, but she described it in detail. And the same is true with this holy wedding ring of Joseph and Mary. There, it actually was in a chapel in Italy, was supposed to be this wedding ring. Now she describes it in massive detail, never saw it. And they say even the days that she had the visions correspond to devotions in the city. July 29th and August 3rd. Those were special days they would uh, thank God for that holy gift, the holy relic. It's a very interesting right there. Um, so those relics, uh, they can be a first-class relic, which is the saint's body, him or herself. Again, we become divinized by being in close relationship with God. So even in the ancient days, they would wreck altars over the remains of the martyrs, for example. Uh, we still have that practice today. Many of the altars in Rome, there's a saint buried right there in the altar. And the second-class relics would be things the person used. Uh, so they were like the clothing of this. That wedding ring would be one example. Uh, things used by the saints, a walking stick, a habit. I saw Mary's dress supposedly in Aachen. It was there in Germany in the shrine. Um, and then third class relics, we touch a holy card to those relics. Those have a, carry a special connection there too. So it just reminds us that the world becomes a holy place by God's presence uh, penetrating more and more into our world through people than even the things they use. The most uh, exalted example of that would be the Shroud of Turin. So I have a photograph just of the close-up of the face of the shroud. Now, they call, uh, Father calls St. Joseph the silent witness in one part of the book. This is also true of the Shroud of Turin. Uh, it's in Turin, Italy, supposed to be the burial cloth of Jesus. There's a whole series we could do about that. But even all the details about the shroud, the pollens found on it, the description of the man who was beaten, who was scourged, and then crucified in the exact way Jesus was, it all corresponds very well to the Gospel accounts. But it wasn't until the late 19th century photography came along. A photographer said, I'm going to take a picture of this. So he takes a long exposure picture, goes to develop it, and he sees the negative shows very starkly the man's face. So finally, this image that was there but difficult to see could be seen in all its detail by a photographic negative. And by studying the shroud, this is the most researched artifact in the world. More than any mummy, any ancient artifact, this Shroud of Turin, the most researched artifact in the world. There's tons of data about this, scientific data. The image is actually three-dimensional, which you need a laser to actually achieve in real life. Um, it has 
different qualities. They found blood samples on the shroud, which are a type AB, which is very rare, except in Jews after the exile. Jesus. Very fascinating stuff about this shroud. So this one, is it a first-class relic? It's not Jesus' body, but it was really close to his body, so it's a very holy thing indeed. The other one that's very uh, beautiful is the Tilma of Guadalupe. So in uh, Mexico, uh, where Mary appeared to St. Juan Diego, uh, he had his, his uh, cactus fiber uh, kind of work coat on, and he carried roses to the bishop to prove Mary had appeared to him, and this image was left then on his apron. Still there today. This is the second most researched artifact in the world. Again, something had physical contact, in this case, with Mary, with an appearance of Mary. And so the way the image is structured, there's all these artistic meanings behind it. This is actually an infrared, when they scan the light behind her. It's woman clothed with the sun from Revelation. They actually are light rays right here going on. Uh, in her eyes, they found images of 14 people who were in the room when St. Juan Diego opened his cloak. Because the human eye reflects images, and they're also concave like the human eye is shaped. Just fascinating things, you know? Uh, so God, when he comes somewhere, when Mary is sent somewhere, they leave evidence, because we live in a real physical world. Uh, the same was true back then in Scripture. It's still true today. So it's not so hard to believe a wedding ring could still be around. Uh, and the house of Laredo, we heard about before, the holy staircase, you know? Because these are people like us who are walking around. Mary still has her body. She was assumed body and soul into heaven. She's walking around. And Jesus, too, risen from the dead. So where he appears, his holy body is still there. The other saints, though, appear in apparition form to us. We heard St. Joseph uh, appeared to St. Faustina. Uh, and also at Fatima, we heard, in Knock, Ireland. Many places he appeared as well. But we have this physical evidence left behind to us to remind us these are real people. And they lived in a real place. And we can go there if we want to. We can go to the Holy Land and see these wonderful sights there. The uh, one closing reflection he has, looking ahead to our themes for this next week, he mentions the Feast of St. Joseph the Worker. So that will be our consecration day is May 1st. This was not a feast day in the church until 1955. And they made it a feast day to counteract the uh, takeover of the May days. So there were many uh, celebrations of May days throughout the, uh, Europe. And then the communists, when they came along, wanted to make a holiday to celebrate their ideology celebrating atheism and the dominance of the state, freeing the worker, supposedly. So to counteract that, the Vatican said, let's have a feast day of the true worker, St. Joseph. And it was years later, St. John Paul II, who had to live in a communist country and saw the warp mentality they had over there in Poland uh, by the, the government, uh, he wanted to write against that. So he wrote an encyclical <coughs> called Laborum Exercens, about the meaning of human work. And St. Joseph, of course, was the patron for this. He was the pinnacle. So St. John Paul II stressed how, in one sense, work is bad. It's a result of the fall. So you have to till the ground. It's difficult. There's toil involved. But also, work brings dignity. So when you, we co-create with God, we do something beautiful, you feel satisfaction. Because you have done something that's in line with your nature. As God is creator, we also assist with that creation. And J.R.R. Tolkien, the Catholic author, he said we are sub-creators as human beings. So he said the artist, whenever he makes something, there's great joy because we are creators in God's image. We want to make things. Whether we're making food, making clothes, making a sculpture, we feel a satisfaction, joy in that. So St. John Paul II brought that out. He said, yeah, St. Joseph shows us that joy in work. There is struggle, of course, and suffering, trying to make our living, but also a satisfaction. And so we should rejoice in work and then encourage others to be able to work. So we talked about addressing unemployment and modern ills of the current state so people can own their own property so they can work. Um, now having read some of those things, like the encyclicals by Pope Leo XIII about human labor, he talked against the massive wage slavery going on, the terrible conditions in factories in the 19th century. Uh, some Catholics said, well, let's make a truly Catholic system of, of economics. And they called it distributism. It doesn't mean redistribution, that weird idea now. It was G.K. Chesterton and Hilaire Belloc. They said, let's make a truly Catholic ideal. So you own your own property, your own means of production, and you have dignity. You are truly in charge of your, of your household, your family. And again, St. Joseph being an inspiration for that kind of approach to things. Um, and of course, Jesus, he was a workman too. Now, he's the son of the carpenter. We think, okay, sure. But he was a carpenter too. We often forget he was a workman himself. 
And there's a beautiful new series out called The Chosen. I don't know if you've seen this yet. It's on online completely. So you can just go to their website and watch. It's called The Chosen. The website has a different title, though, but The Chosen is the name of it. And they show Jesus doing carpentry. It's very interesting. It's an uh, evangelical take on the Gospels, but the main actor who plays Jesus is Catholic. He's on form. He's on a recent interview about that. And the great um, humility he felt playing Jesus. He, gets to des he describes that for us. Very exciting. But they show in one of the episodes Jesus making things out of wood, which he would have done as a carpenter, you know? Very interesting. Uh, so to see that that work was something that was Jesus himself valued, and he would have done that work for until his public ministry, when preaching became his major occupation. So it's uh, good to see Jesus in action there as the carpenter. We see St. Joseph sometimes in movies, but not so much Jesus. So there's a neat reflection about that. And there's just one more way where St. Joseph, as a true father of Jesus, had an influence on him. He taught him that trade, but also Jesus practiced that trade. He actually was a carpenter and worked in wood, but also stone, as they did it back at that time. All right, so then uh, we have those questions for us at the end, some discussion questions. We looked ahead last time at page um, 255 and 6 to those discussion questions that we, of things we read for this, uh, already for this week. Uh, so page 256 mentions things we've already gone over about Joseph the just man, and those three theories of his discovery of the pregnancy, the holy wedding ring. There's some about the sorrows and joys of St. Joseph, you know, his experience of scriptural events. Was Joseph young or old? We had a debate last time, something to consider right there. The sleeping Joseph, and his presence, his proximity to Christ. He didn't receive holy communion. Uh, Mary would have later, but uh, Joseph did not, but he was still adoring Jesus. He was in his presence right there. Uh, they mentioned those things. And then for day 22, on page 257, they have some questions for us today about um, patience, especially the virtue of patience, and Joseph being a good example of that. We reviewed before about the different Eucharistic prayers as well, so I wasn't going to go over that with us here, and how, again, the name of St. Joseph was added to Eucharistic Prayer 1, the Roman camp. They reviewed that a little bit here. Um, and then again, for uh, next week, our discussion, you can look ahead on page 258, they have some questions for that fifth group meeting. The things to consider again about the poverty of Joseph. So the Holy Family was not rich. They consider what that actually means. Um, the Feast of Joseph the Worker. Uh, the thing about the statue of St. Joseph to help sell a house. We talked about that one a little bit. Um, and then other saints, we see more apparitions of St. Joseph and the other saints' love for St. Joseph in 4 and 5. Uh, and there's the Holy Staircase we mentioned as well. They talk about that. So consider those questions again in the reading for this week ahead. Again, journal about those, get some ideas about that. And then we're very close to the end. We'll have our next meeting uh, next week, uh, and then just a couple more days till May 1st, till our Consecration Day. So if you can join us again for the Consecration Day on Saturday, May 1st, we'll have a Tridentine High Latin Mass in the morning at 10. You can join us for that if you wish, and afterwards we'll make the Consecration. But also the Saturday Vigil Mass at 5 will also be a chance for the Consecration. I'll hear confessions before Mass as well to prepare us for that. So again, continue reading with our readings right here and look at those discussion questions that help shape our uh, understanding of St. Joseph and what he's doing in our lives.